much. Thank you, first of all, for the for the invitation. It's it's also a, a pleasure, I think, for uh, for me as as a Pole and and also as a member of Parliament to to have this opportunity to talk to you on Europe and to have this exchange on Europe. I remember uh, in 2003 it was or two when you had the second referendum on on Nice Treaty and and I was engaged by the. Uh, Irish government also to, to come and have a discussion on, on uh, why we need a Nice Treaty because it happened so that at that time it was the condition for the enlargement basically. If we didn't have Nice Treaty, we wouldn't be able to have enlargement. I, I, remember. Pardon, I must say that your speech is on the record. You have agreed to that. Yes, and okay, okay. And, and I remember, yes, we'll be off that's, the record, that's fine. Just I so still. That everybody is aware of that. Thing. Yeah. And uh, I, I remember my first discussion in the radio in the morning uh, with, with some people who were against the, the Nice Treaty ratification. By, by Ireland, and when I was using the argument uh, of uh, uh, of how important it was for Poland, and I even from the anti-European opposition at that time in Ireland, I got huge support for Polish accession. So I, I continue to be grateful to the uh, to the Irish. But here I, I I would like to start by saying that uh, the crisis is behind us, but it's not, and we are. Um, depend how you count, but probably most of us would agree that we are more or less in the fourth year of crisis in in Europe. And even though uh, absolutely unprecedented reforms have been undertaken um, thus far, a fully recovered Europe is, is still quite a, a distant uh, prospect. And we, we have to admit as, as politicians, but also as academic society in Europe, that we didn't see the crisis. Uh, coming, we did not uh, prevent it. Uh, but I think uh, as Europe, we, we did react through a, um, a multifold approach uh, to, the, to this economic turmoil, uh, matching this multidimensional um, nature of the, of the crisis. And, and we, uh, we all know that, that all those different aspects and dimensions of the crisis, but uh, I think that finally the most important one, which is probably still to stay with us for a while is the crisis of confidence, of lack of confidence of everybody against everybody. And I think that's something which, um, which, of which, from which Europe will, will continue to suffer for a while. Um, the, the changes that uh, were triggered, uh, the reforms, the changes that were triggered by the uh, crisis, I think they, they, it's important to see that they covered three major areas. Certainly the most famous one is the austerity, um, philosophy and, and practice, and talking about it in Ireland, I, I, uh, I take all the risks, but uh, I am extremely critical about what we have done and how we have um, uh, done, it, done it, because we, we know that many initial assumptions and also med measures underlying adjustment um, programs were mistaken and growth did not uh, return uh, so far and uh, uh, we, we, we will probably for decades discuss and raise the issues of um, the pace and composition of the fiscal adjustment. So that was one area where we, uh, within which we, 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 we reacted as, as Europeans. And at the same time, uh, extremely important two waves of uh, very far-reaching and truly unprecedented, unthinkable before the crisis, uh, policy reforms were undertaken. I'm thinking here of all the reforms uh, related to the financial sector, where we continue uh, with reforms. And the second um, uh, complementing sort of uh, part of the uh, reforms uh, was the is still the deep restructuring of economic uh, governance, prioritizing, of course, the, for understandable reasons, the, uh, the euro uh, zone, because we discovered very quickly that the pre-crisis EMU architecture based on Maastricht Treaty uh, was not only incomplete, um, uh, but also uh, laxly implemented, so a, a kind of radical uh, design shift was absolutely required, um, and we are still in it, as you uh, as you know. Um, the the challenge, of course, is as we are um, reconstructing our architecture as as Europe um, as a response to the crisis. We must also be aware and avoid the, the risks of undermining the foundations of Europe. And I will just later on maybe come back to this uh, to this issue. We 
Yeah, and just maybe two or three issues in, in this context, because we are reaching out uh, more often than recently, uh, on the recent, or in the recent decades before the crisis, we did. We are reaching out uh, very frequently to the intergovernmental solutions, also for reasons which can be uh, justified. Um, uh, when uh, preparing the, the completion of the uh, EMU. It, it's also, I think, important to, um, uh, to see in this uh, context that uh, by not addressing some of the issues, um, we are also um, increasing the risk of, of uh, even of the erosion of what we have. And I'm thinking here of not, not completing the EMU architecture with the fiscal part of it, uh, I think we are also undermining or weakening the, the monetary uh, part of the of the architecture. So there are many, many, I, I would say, challenges and risks related also to the way we uh, with the way uh, we reconstruct our uh, architecture. And I would like maybe to to say uh, a few words on on uh, on the challenges as I see them today, because whoever you, whomever you could ask, everybody would probably have a different list of challenges or things to do. Uh, for Europe. Uh, unfortunately, very lately, but I think increasingly we all agree that Europe needs growth and that reigniting um, growth is a must, is, a, is a probably number one uh, challenge for Europe uh, today. But also, maybe especially when I look at the challenges from the parliamentary European Parliament point of view, uh, the, the challenge of securing political legitimacy to everything that we are, uh, we are doing. My personal uh, important um, uh, challenge is also uh, the, the, the need of a new treaty. I know what it means to say it in Ireland, um, uh, but I, I would just like to elaborate later on a little bit on, on it uh, as well. So what I'm trying to say with this is that we should use really very wisely the momentum for treaty change. So there is, without any doubt, the treaty change uh, need. But, but it has to be. It would have to be handled in such a way that it wouldn't bring all the risks that we know, which are linked to the any treaty change in in Europe. And then, as a poll, I would like to say that um, a very important challenge, which I see, but uh, which I think is real, uh, and I think everybody sees it, but. Uh, we, we, not everybody would see it as, as an important, is, is the uh, way we, we should manage or we can manage the emerging multi-tier Europe, because without doubt we, we are uh, facing this uh, division uh, on the basis of Euro, non-Euro um, criterion. Um, so with regard to, to growth, uh, I think that uh, we clearly failed with the austerity because the austerity was not there for austerity, but the austerity was, uh, in fact, supposed to, to bring the growth through the stability that it was supposed to introduce. Um, it, it was uh, aiming at uh, restoring the, the sustainable uh, path for the, uh, for the debt. Uh, we, we also expected that uh, uh, the austerity will be a remedy against the increasing spreads. We, we didn't take into account the, the fact that the spreads were growing due to both deteriorating foundations, which is extremely important, but also as an effect of collective um, panic or collective movements of panic, of fear, of general lack of confidence. We, we didn't, uh, I think we, we uh, underestimate the, the markets uh, very clearly because markets had started to uh, look um, not only on the deficits and debts, but at, at the growth capacity of the member states much earlier than we admitted this as policy makers and decision makers in, in this um, uh, context. So I think that the, um, the, these were the, the markets which uh, did not allow governments to resume borrowing and competitive uh, cost uh, because uh, we, we made wrong assumption about, about this and very quickly we also um, so that the lack of liquidity is not only coming from the private investors through which uh, the liquidity remained sparse at that time, uh, but also the banking uh, sector um, uh, behavior remained, remains, I would say, uh, disappointing. And also in this context, the, the ECB 
um, transmission, monetary policy transmission channels uh, remained dysfunctional throughout the crisis and basically continue to be uh, dysfunctional. So we we assumed when we introduced the, the uh, austerity packages, there was a lot of assumptions made, which in fact were were false, as the reality has uh, shown, and and the austerity did not work as a machinery towards uh, growth. With the time passing and the insistence of some prime ministers, of course, that there were. The rules were somewhat relaxed, but I think we, we started to see the, to admit uh, that we uh, hoped uh, um, to, to achieve results which, which could never come with this type of uh, austerity. So, so that's uh, this reigniting growth clearly through austerity didn't work, so now we see that growth will not come by itself, that we need really a good orchestration of efforts at all levels of European governance, European national, regional, local, um, as well, uh, to get back uh, Europe on the path towards sustainable um, uh, growth. Uh, but in this context, the, the real problem that Europe has is the competitiveness problems. We, we don't talk yet enough, I think, on, on, on the competitiveness crisis that we have in Europe. And in this context, this huge divide between the north and the south in terms of competitiveness, with the east dynamically growing in this sense, but still far from, from the levels that we would like to achieve in terms of competitiveness. So that's one of the challenges in the context of growth. The second issue is certainly the um, restarting the what we call the Europe's convergence machinery, because we the, the integration has started trade investment, the internal market. This, this has been extremely powerful um, growth machinery for, for decades, but uh, around 10 years ago, uh, if you look into statistics, this machinery has definitely slowed uh, down. And the crisis, I think, added to the fragmentation of, of single market and uh, uh, this, this convergence machinery with a single market at heart. This is, I think, something which for the growth is, is absolutely um, uh, fundamental in, in, in Europe. And the third area where we need also, I think, a, a, a wise policy and a smart policy is, is uh, of course, European enterprise, the environment for European enterprises, because we all know that growth does not come from what politicians <coughs> say, but even though in the context of confidence, also what politicians say matters, we, we know it today, but basically this is the European enterprises that are the, the fuel for this, uh, to keep the, the growth uh, really running um, uh, in, in, in Europe. And here we, we know that um, the, the enterprise sector faces currently in Europe uh, huge, huge uh, problems and challenges related to, to many, many issues certainly also to the globalization, uh, to the competitive pressure coming from the global world, but also all the uncertainty related to the standards, if you think of energy or climate-related standards, if you think now of the also transatlantic negotiations that will come, there is also a lot of uncertainty how we will end up with what kind of uh, results with regard to standards. So this uncertainty, uh, the, the risk aversion that basically continues also in uh, in, in Europe and especially for SMEs, we, we don't have venture capital really functioning. So a, a lot of issues which are um, uh, related to, to to environment in which European enterprise works, especially small and medium-sized enterprise works. Uh, we need a lot of action there on the policy side to facilitate the, the growth uh, uh, inclination to, to create really uh, the will to, to uh, invest and to create uh, jobs and, and make Europe also um, uh, more competitive. In this context of the limits or, or the barriers, financial barriers, the, the lack of funding for, for growth, especially for SMEs, we have had recently a lot of discussions also with banking sector, with manufacturers in, in the European uh, Parliament, and uh, we clearly see that there is a, um, still a, a lot to, to do there, and, and also ECB is fully aware of the fact that the monetary transmission, monetary policy transmission channels are, are dysfunctional, that whatever ECB is doing 
is maybe bringing more confidence uh, gradually that all the policy, monetary policy operations, which were aiming at increasing the, uh, the, the capacity and also the willingness of the banking sector to, to restart financing growth, this does not uh, function. And Mr. Draghi, each time he is in European Parliament, he is um, admitting this. Um, uh, it's not a failure, but it's sort of lack of capacity or lack of efficiency in this, which uh, which is not only depending probably on central bank. The, so, so that's one, the growth-related issues. The legitimacy, uh, political democratic legitimacy uh, problem in, in Europe is that um, there is a certain paradox in, in those reforms which we are um, introducing because of the crisis, uh, because we are, everybody is saying more Europe, some people say maybe not more, but a better Europe, or, but in any case there are more and more decisions which uh, um, take more and more issues up to the European level for decision making, for, uh, for action, so there is a kind of, kind of some people say centralization, other people say this federalization of the way Europe functions uh, because of the crisis or thanks to the uh, crisis. And that, of course, by definition, increases the distance between uh, Europe and the um, uh, ordinary uh, citizens. And uh, the, the problem in Europe is also that democracy is largely and remains a largely a national uh, dimension of, of our life, a national uh, issue. And we have not, in fact, succeeded uh, in, in, in building a, a supranational democracy, European democracy framework. We hope that with the uh, new treaty and with the European Parliament uh, enhanced uh, role, that this issue of democratic legitimacy will be addressed. But if you think of, of uh, really of European elections, I don't know the data for Ireland, I know for Poland, uh, turnout for European elections is extremely low, and th that's generally in, in, um, in many, many countries. So that undermines, in a way, the democratic legitimacy of this institution. And also, if you, now I see it when I am inside, that uh, the, 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 what matters for people there, for members, it's, it's more the relationship with the parties than with the citizens. So it's again uh, something that we are not really contributing sufficiently as, as parliament to this. But secondly, also, uh, you know that we go through this, uh, all the reforms and reaction to the crisis, through something what is what one would call probably piecemeal approach. So there's no, again, finalité politique is not there. No, we don't have the final uh, vision. We don't know really, we, we don't present to the public um, as politicians, as policymakers, this, um, uh, where, where this grand change is aiming at. So when you don't have such a vision, such a strategy, which for big issues we always had, because when we had the single market, when EMU was there, we always had an action plan step by step, and we knew for the uh, trade or custom union, there's this year 10%, next year 15%, so everything was now. Now we don't have it, and when you don't have such a vision, it's difficult to go to the to your sit to your voters and explain to them where we are aiming and get them on board. And uh, we so we are with this lack of vision, we are unable to mobilize the extremely important, I think, the um, uh, machinery, endorse, major endorsement machinery for the reforms in Europe, which is public opinion, which are, which are people. And that's also, I think, one of the weaknesses with regard to the democratic uh, legitimacy uh, issue. I can also tell you that what is important is the cooperation between, for all the reforms, which are linking better the national policy making with European uh, policy making now with European semester and all those uh, related with these reforms. We need good cooperation between uh, national parliaments and European parliament. And we, uh, the treaty introduced uh, uh, the role of the national parliaments in, in a very sort of um, not very serious way because we, we, we gave the power to the national parliaments to block things if they consider that they are not respecting subsidiarity. But that's a sort of negative uh, instrument. I remember in the convention the discussion on this uh, instrument, but we have it. And now we, are try we have been trying for the last three years after the entry of the Lisbon Treaty into effect uh, to build uh, some relationship, institutionalized relationship between European Parliament and National Parliament. So National Parliaments come, we have 
sort of formal statements are read, again, it's, it's not really bringing us together with uh, uh, kind of providing a double legitimation for, uh, for what we are doing in Europe. So still a long way to go to find a, the right cooperation between the two uh, parliaments. And, and then, of course, we have the, the role of European Council and, and President Van Rompuy, where uh, it's, it's an institution which does not have um, legislative power, but it's an institution, and also it's an institution that very, very often works behind the closed doors, like now for the genuine EMU, which is a, a process uh, which was launched by the European Council with some support from the Commission. There are Sherpas, so people working with prime ministers, working with Mr. Van Rompuy. Now we are also having parliamentarian Sherpas, three colleagues, uh, going there to those meetings on the general economic and monetary union and the ex-ante coordination and, and many other things. Um, but, but in a way, it's not clear what this institution is all about. We didn't, I, I think, uh, it's, it's a little bit executive, a little bit uh, quasi-legislative. Uh, but, but not really very transparent. So that makes also this, this issue of legitimacy and leaving the European Parliament out of the, of the debate. Uh, there is this issue uh, very important. The General Affairs Council, which was transparent, which was traditionally preparing all the council meeting and everything was clear and uh, the Parliament was somehow involved. Now the General Affairs Council is completely out. We have this new process of the European Council with Sherpas working. So it's again... Uh, sort of n not helping with the democratic legitimacy at this uh, stage. And now a few words maybe on the treaty change, because I, I think the situation has matured to have a treaty change. And if we, were, uh, if we didn't have our history of treaty changes, and if we didn't know how difficult it is, probably we would have been already... Um, and somebody would add, if we didn't have the German elections also in, uh, this year, uh, but in the parliament, there is a strong push towards, I mean, as much as parliament can push anybody, uh, a strong push towards uh, this, this need of treaty change for various reasons. I think um, one of those is certainly the need to consolidate all the reforms that we have introduced, because the, the reforms, all those six packs, two packs, the fiscal compact, the, all the financial assistance instruments, there's enormous amount of instruments which some of them are under community methods, some of them are under the intergovernmental method because of the lack of the provisions in the treaty that would allow uh, for a different decision making and where the UK wouldn't be able to block the, for example, the, the, the move. So, so there is the need now to look at all those reforms and consolidate them uh, because we are adding new reforms to uh, things which we thought in the parliament that they already solved. Now we are adding this genuine EMU uh, reform. So I think that to have the, the treaty change or the convention or a process of discussing the new treaty, because it doesn't have to be immediately a treaty change, but to discuss all those things and to see how to put them into the framework of community method and into the, the, the treaty, this is something which, uh, which I think is, is uh, worth looking um, uh, at. And then, of course, we have a list of issues which cannot be solved without the treaty basis and, and the whole reform of the second pillar of the EMU, the, the whole fiscal capacity, the, the euro bonds or whatever, debt mutualization, if you call it like this. I mean, if we, we, we go for some acceptable for everybody solutions, we cannot do it without the, uh, the treaty change. And then there are many ideas also which we actually react very strongly negatively as a parliament in total, but with strong lobbies in favor, which is this idea of dividing the, the parliament into the euro area parliament and, and, and the rest, or whatever you would, you would call it. There are ideas in the parliament to, they were already in the, in the legislative procedures as well, but were, were uh, erased, deleted, to have a, a special committee where only the euro area uh, deputies <coughs> would have the right to vote or to, to, uh, to decide. So for the time being, the, the, we are against and we are, uh, when the treaty is very clear on this, uh, the, this cannot be done, but there is certainly this um, uh, this movement in this uh, direction, supported very strongly by, surprisingly, by European Commission. European Commission is, is very clearly aiming at 
I think being in the next, um, after the election, the Commission for Eurozone, and probably with some maybe addition for the rest. I'm a little bit bitter on this because we are surprised that every regulation that comes from the Commission is only for Euro area, and then it's the Parliament and it is member states that are pushing for opt-in solutions, allowing opening uh, the, uh, the, the, the new legislative frameworks for also those uh, non-Euro member states who would like to, to, to join uh, to be in. And that takes me to the last issue, which is this emerging multi-tier, we used to say double speed Europe, but now we see that it's a bit more than, than speed. Uh, and we used to, then we used to say double tier, but then we think of UK, for, exa for example, if you compare it with Poland, we are in a very different situation with regards to Euro, joining uh, Euro. But um, it, w without an, any doubt, uh, this um, division is, is, is there, and it's going to grow. and. For example, I can tell you that as Poles, we understand that we have to have the deepening of the Euro area integration. So because we are interested in being outside, we are interested in having a strong and well-functioning Eurozone. So we understand that the deepening there and the reforms of this core of Europe are absolutely essential. But we don't want to be left uh, completely aside and to be on a trajectory that will take us away from, from where the Euro area integration is, is moving because the, uh, as, as our plan is one day, uh, we are discussing the dates and, and all those things, uh, but it's difficult, uh, one day we, we will join and then if we don't work together very closely and if we are not uh, part of, of the changes, of the changing frameworks, uh, then it will be more and more uh, difficult. So uh, we have this situation that um, we have the, this um, regulatory framework changing and deepening the Eurozone uh, integration. And um, it, it is uh, uh, having an impact uh, potentially, or, or even probably you can uh, find some examples even now, on also further disintegration of single market, because you, you will have two categories of um, of states uh, there, and it can also uh, weaken uh, the Europe's standing on the global scene, because the world, if you talk to the Chinese, they don't understand how we can again divide Europe, because they always want us to come as one uh, unity and not to, to, uh, to have all those small countries, and including Germany, it's very small for them, so it's a... Um, it's an issue also globally, I think. But what is current approach for this? So the, there is no, as I said, generally the European Commission when preparing the, the new regulations, including the banking union or single supervision uh, or a six pack, two pack, everything was always for Eurozone. And then it's Council who is introducing the opt in possibility for non Euro <coughs> and the Parliament who is also very strong though not unanimous on, um, uh, on this. But the challenge is the following, that for every regulation we have a sort of we have a case by case approach to this. So when there is a new regulation, we think how to organize the opt-in uh, mechanism. And, and this is, uh, so, so it's like a permanent struggle, I would say, and just up the hill uh, all the time. And the non-Euro members are supported. We have Sweden, we have Poland, they're very active, I think, on those. Uh, issues very clearly. Others, rather, I would say, follow, uh, but not in the first um, front. So I think that we 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 need to um, uh, now with exante coordination and this genuine EMU. Also, the Commission proposal is eurozone only, and uh, and this is about the reforms, um, structural reforms. So again, the, the same uh, battle uh, has uh, started. Uh, so the, I would say that the, the policy stance on the non-euro uh, area remains kind of confused. So it's not, Europe has not decided really how to cope with this issue. And uh, this opt-in system probably for this, we, we, we would need a kind of blueprint for opt-in. So there would be a certain elements for common for all the regulations and making it uh, clear that um, the... the uh, reducing the uncertainty about the role of the non-Euro member states who do not have the permanent derogation. So, so this is a, a very sort of confused, I would say, area of our work. And, and I, uh, some people are afraid that uh, after the European elections next year, when we will start to, to <coughs> formulate the Commission, we don't know yet how it will come to into effect, but 
but that's, uh, that there will be a, a even institutionalized focus on, on uh, euro area. There are also fears, those who are against the treaty change, and not only the Irish, but also those who, who think that the treaty change would introduce this. It would be a treaty for euro area, uh, with some addition and annexes for the non-euro. Um, so so there is, uh, this is an issue which I think can create a, a lot of bad blood, I would say, in the years to come politically, so we have to be very serious on this. So, but in any case, if I could just say the last sentence, I, 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 um, I spoke yesterday with Joschka Fischer on, on, uh, on other issues, and he used this, um, this uh, formula of, of the erosion of Europe. And I think this is an, an extremely adequate word, because we... There's no big bank, nothing really big is happening to, to show that Europe is, that something is happening with Europe. But if you look carefully into the public attitude, into this democratic legitimacy, into this idea of, of going whenever there is an opportunity for intergovernmental solutions and not community methods, if you think of this fragmentation of the single market that didn't come with this uh, multi-tier uh, Europe, if you think of the signals that come from the UK, and we, we don't know what would be the impact of, of um, if there are any further discussions on, it, on public opinion, on, on moods, on, and if you think of also, if you talk to our German friends, what they think of the Greek friends, I mean, there are stereotypes created and deepened which, which are very damaging for the European unity. So there is this risk of, of a kind of erosion which uh, if we don't sort of react in the last minute, uh, then we, we, it might be too late. So, so it's, it's not easy, but, uh, but generally I'm optimistic. I, I've been always saying that Europe, Euro will never uh, disappear, or I, I could never join those uh, who had doubts, and uh, um, and I, I would probably will never uh, forget it to the our American friends who are in New York Times basically every day something about the need for eurozone to disappear. So it's a, it's it's a difficult time, but also interesting. Professor Hoopman, thank you very much.